oxygenation to it, then there would be no life. And it's very interesting that Earth is an organic planet in what is essentially an inorganic solar system, and that this particular solar system is based very, very heavily on, on celestial mechanics and, and mathematic principles. It's a very, very mathematically constructed solar system, more than any other ones. If you look out and, and start doing research into what solar systems they have found, which are outside this one, which is not many, but they've found a few, they don't operate on, on celestial mechanical principles the same as this one does. So this is a very, very mechanical solar system, and yet we have this very, very symbiotic relationship with the sun that no other planet has. So, yeah, that, that's just an interesting part of the, uh, of the Nagamati legend, the, uh, the Sapphire myth, which is quite, a, quite an interesting story. It's actually fantastic uh, mythos that they have around the creation of the Earth and the creation of this solar system, the creation of the Archons and the predator mind and the whole thing. It's very, very interesting to, to hear their take on it. We had Laura Eisenhower on the show about uh, two weeks ago. Very, very interesting guest. She's also going to be speaking at the For Your Mind conference. And for those that like to you know, learn more about the Archons and the Sophiac myth, Laura has done an amazing job putting uh, a great wealth of information and data together. I, I want to take a step back here and talk about some of the uh, – some of the really incredibly distorted ways that some people are viewing reality. And you, I haven't heard you ever really get agitated except for one time. And I understand why you were on the truth or girls radio show. And a particular individual came up, uh, Dallas Goldbug, who, whatever, whoever his real name is. And I remember hearing what you were saying about, you know, and I want you to kind of ex- ex- explain to the audience for those that haven't heard who is Dallas Goldbug, uh, because you know we're talking about a person that pretends to be a conspiracy researcher that's legitimate and takes people, including myself. He said I was Mark Dice. No, I'm five seven. I'm not six foot. Mark Dice is over six foot. I'm pretty sure I'm not six foot. I'm pretty sure Mark Dice is not five seven. A- a- and so you know, I just kind of shrugged it aside. Whatever. Shortly after what you talked about uh, on the Truth of Girls radio show with uh, Morning Mayan and another individual, I went to someone's house here in the San Luis Valley that was going to let me use their internet to do my show. And he was trying to tell me, because he was somewhat in this information, he, he said he was a like mind. He was getting angry with me, visibly angry with me, Max. And this was just a week after hearing you on the Truth of Girls radio show that I did not believe him that Luke Kurdowski of WeAreChange.org was the Arizona shooter. He was actually yelling at me. And this is, this is, I had a guest on and I'm in someone's home and they're yelling at me, telling me to put up the pictures of, of Luke Kurdowski next to the Arizona shooter. And that was, that was, um, that was a rough moment, Max. To see that, you know, that there is such a strong degree of cognitive failure, um, a, a major uh, thinking malfunction, where people can think that two people that don't even look alike are the same person. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, and if there's perhaps something more sinister to the Dallas Goldbug, we'll call it Operation. Oh, it's a co-intel operation, absolutely. I mean, whether he knows he's doing it or whether he's just programmed to do it, I mean, I don't know, but it's an absolute co-intel operation. I mean, the information that you see there is so blatantly false. And it's it's put there, I believe, to discredit the truth movement. So you can show how crazy these people are. And look, I mean, like you say, when you see someone like that and they don't look anything like each other and you've got some guy yelling at you about it, these people are mentally unstable. So that's the sort of person, the, the sort of people that he's reaching now, these are mentally unstable people that are liable to do bad things. And it also puts you in danger because, you know, he's claiming that you're members of an elite, you're, you're a member of an elite family that's working to um, enslave the whole world. And you're out there, you've got a radio show, you're living in town, and then suddenly somebody comes along and puts a bullet in your head because they believe that you're this terrible uh, guy from this banking family who's responsible for the death of all these people because he got it from Dallas Goldbuck. So it endangers your life. It draws huge wedges into the truth community and gets everybody to question everybody else. It's distrust. It's this predator mind. That's what it's all about. But, you know, he may not even realize that he's doing it. He may totally believe what he's doing is legitimate research. That's the thing. So, you know, you've got to really look at it. But 
I would suggest that it's a COINTELOP. You know, the way it was put together and, and Sandy Hook and the whole actors thing, I mean, this whole thing seems to have been put there like a, a bad tabloid to paint all conspiracy uh, researchers as as crazy and that all conspiracy theory is completely ridiculous, you know. I mean, if you believe 9-11 was an inside job, then, then you believe that um, uh, some guy, one of the guys in Sandy Hook was, uh, was uh, Tony Hawk and you believe that Jodie Foster plays the role of Julia Gillard. You believe that, um, uh, what's the comedian? Bill Hicks is Alex Jones. You know, so you're crazy. You're crazy. And, and not only that, but it was one of these conspiracy theorists that went and shot all those kids to begin with. His mum was a prepper, so she was feeding all this information to him. So you guys are all crazy, so we need Homeland Security to go and take out all these alternative researchers because they're, they're domestic terrorists. They're, they're crazy. They believe all this crazy stuff, and, and we need to uh, tidy up this place and get rid of these people. That's what it's all about, you know, and you can see it. It's so obvious. I mean, the information he presents is, is so blatantly false and blatantly wrong that, that you know that it's a psyop. Either that or he's, he's just a, a very, very um, sick man, you know, with a very, very uh, extremely damaged uh, mentality. Well, I can't say it. There were people that warned me before I went over there, but <laughs> lesson learned. I mean, maybe he's listening now, wondering, uh, you know, what this government agent is up to. Uh, okay, moving on to some of our more serious topics, uh, at least solution oriented, and you know, we're talking about the reality where we're going beyond money as it currently is. And I'm curious what your ideas are on that. You've talked a little bit about credit unions. And uh, there's a website called Solari.com. Uh, I forget her name because it's been a long day, but I've interviewed her many times. And she's Catherine, been advocating this for at least six or seven years. And Catherine Austin Fitz? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I haven't really looked into what she, she says on uh, Solaris. She did feature um, Transformation on there when I released it, so I was pleased with that. Someone sent me a link. But I haven't really looked into it. I mean... The whole money system is a very, very tricky issue because money is something that we always use, so we can't just sort of get rid of it all of a sudden. And I don't like the idea of a credit-based system. I don't like the idea of a digital monetary system. Uh, I like the idea of there being no money, but I think it'll be a gradual process to get to a stage where we, we figure out that we don't actually need this stuff. That's why I believe um, we need to find a way of, of reining this system in. And I, I believe the way to do it is to understand that the government are simply public trustees, regardless of what legislation they put in place, regardless of what rules they've written down in books. You know, we we are what created society, and society is what created government. They're way down the food chain. They're there as trustees of what we hold, which is the earth. You know, the earth is is us. It, it's it's not something that we have to earn. It's not something that we have to buy. It is ours. And this is what what this society has basically done is it's dispossessed everybody. And now it's trying to, it, it manages to keep them enslaved by just being alive. So we have to address that situation and realize that it's just a small group of people that are controlling it. And actually the whole government situation is a, is a trust agreement. These are public trustees. They're all in breach of trust and we have to step above it and start, you know, regaining things a little bit that way. You have to rein the system in, get rid of all the toxins out of our environment, all the toxins out of the food, all the chemicals and fluoride out of the water and send us back down the track to what we should be. And eventually I think we'll get to a situation where we don't need money. But at the moment, I guess it's a necessary evil. You know, the the big, the most positive system I've seen so far is um, mathematically perfected economy. Mike Montana's mathematically perfected economy. It's very hard to get your head around. I'm not mathematical at all, so it's difficult for me. But um, it, it sounds like it works. When, he, when I had him on the show and he explained it to me, I remember thinking, yeah, this could actually work. And I think that that would be a great stepping stone to um, get to a situation where we didn't need money at all. Because really, I don't think we would need it. If we come back online, if our higher senses come back online, which will only happen once we get the toxins and, and stuff out of the environment, then I, I don't think we'll need it. People think that they, they can't imagine a world without money. They can't imagine a world without commerce. But I think it, it, it all comes down to a, a state of your consciousness. And I think that once their higher faculties started to come back online, they'd soon realize that it rarely doesn't work that way at all. And and take a look at this, for those listening. Um, there's been a lot of information that we've seen about the sun. 
and the Earth's weakening magnetic field and holes in the Earth's weakening magnetic field and um, information that is indicating that M-class flares in the future will have the effect of X-class flares. And because we have such a strong dependency on a centralized electric grid, if something were to impact that, um, it could impact banks, it could impact satellites. It doesn't mean that we couldn't bounce back from it or that it would be permanent. But at the moment, uh, it could cause a serious malfunction, breakdown of the world economic system. And the History Channel keeps referring to this as a end-of-the-world type of event. And since I have become interested in solar flares, fascinated with them, beginning in 2007, 2008, and by the way, at the age of eight years old, I used to have dreams of a solar flare hitting the planet and, and a powerless reality. And that was not implanted into me by uh, any form of predictive programming. Uh, I was actually having these dreams. And, and so what I'm wondering, Max, is if this is a part of the shift. If we go back into a situation where there's, there's no more money and there's some sort of event that forces people to come together and, and, and grow their own food, and, and in a way, for those of us that are not comfortable with the direction that um, the police state has gone, basically being our own police. Uh, some could say the word militia, um, but not you know fanatical but people that defend their own neighborhoods, defend their women without the use of police, I see that as a big, big part of, of becoming free when we're no longer dependent on 911, when we know the neighbors across the street. And this is why, Max, I think that we do need alternative communities because, because some of us have been trying our entire lives within the system. We've been trying our entire lives to have meetups with people that are in the city that don't have the time to get together and go, how are we going to get off the grid together because there's too many parties going on? This was what I was competing with the whole time, Max, in Portland, was people within the system, within the city, within the grid that never wanted to take the time to come together to a meetup. And if they did, it was because they were looking for me to be their leader or a Portland version of Alex Jones. And I was looking to have more of a community, but I wasn't able. So I changed my location to an area where the neighbors do know each other. Um, and no, we're not exactly an alternative community, an alternate community, because many of us still need money to go buy things within the city. Gasoline is a big cost. Sometimes it takes money to get wood. Um, but for me to be out here so far from mainstream America, it's challenging me to develop those social skills, to, to be friends with other people that might think that I'm a freak show just for having uh, an alternative perspective. Um, there's some people that know what I do in the valley and they like me out simply because there's an independent thinker in the valley. And that's all it is. And so I'm working, Max, to not let that stuff bother me, but to be optimistic that that maybe we can do something together because I'm starting to see signs. There's more people moving into the area of the San Luis Valley that are finding me on Facebook. Um, some of them are YouTube viewers. And I've been really frustrated living out here in sometimes negative 30-degree weather, but I'm starting to see a, a shift, uh, and I think that more people are going to be moving up here in the future. And so, I mean, I think this is just kind of a message for everyone living wherever you are in, in the United States or elsewhere. Um, if we can find a way to work together, those of us that are like minds that, that don't want to screw each other over, over financial issues or, or anything else – then I think we have a chance. But I do still think that there are some ways that we can work within the city, the, the city or the system, and that there's a place for that too. I think the answer, at least for me, is to look into my own heart and see where that's leading me. And I think that's the answer for every listener in the audience, for them to follow their heart and listen to their inner guidance as to what their own solution is going to be. And, and where they are environmentally is going to play a really big part. Well, look, it is. I mean, everybody should be growing food. I've been saying this for years. You know, you've, you've got to start putting gardens in. We've got a lot of gardens in down New South Wales. We just used to plant them randomly a couple of years ago, but um, that, that's kind of slacked off. But almost everybody I know has got vegetable gardens in. And, you know, alternate communities are great to get off the grid, but my, my argument is that too many people go out there and they attempt to create a working model of an alternate society so that they can then show it to the world. I mean, they... they they don't participate in the one that we've got, and we need to save this one, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of power in having uh, 
one foot in each world. And as I'm trying to do, keep one foot connected to the Internet and keeping the show going, and yet experiencing 